A Dill Pickle by Catherine Mansfield Of Dramatic Reading, Scene, and Story Collection, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Larry Wilson. Vera, read by Savannah Olday. Thomas, read by Todd. And then, after six years, she saw him again. He was seated at one of those little bamboo tables, decorated with a Japanese vase of paper daffodils. There was a tall plate of fruit in front of him, and very carefully, in a way she recognized immediately as his special way, he was peeling an orange. He must have felt the shock of recognition in her, for he looked up and met her eyes. Incredible! He didn't know her. She smiled. He frowned. She came towards him. He closed his eyes an instant. But opening them, his face lit up as though he had struck a match in a dark room. He laid down the orange and pushed back his chair. And she took her little warm hand out of her muff and gave it to him. Vera! he exclaimed. How strange! Really, for a moment, I didn't know you. Won't you sit down? You've had lunch? Won't you have some coffee? She hesitated, but of course she meant to. Yes, I'd like some coffee. And she sat down opposite him. You've changed. You've changed very much, he said, staring at her with that eager, lighted look. You look so well. I've never seen you look so well before. Really? She raised her veil and unbuttoned her high fur collar. I don't feel very well. Can't bear this weather, you know. Oh, no. You hate the cold. Loathe it. She shuddered. And the worst of it is that the older one grows... He interrupted her. Excuse me. And tapped on the table for the waitress. Please bring some coffee and cream. To her. You are sure you won't eat anything? Some fruit, perhaps. The fruit here is very good. No, thanks. Nothing. Then that's settled. And smiling just a hint too broadly, he took up the orange again. You were saying, the older one grows? The colder. She laughed. But she was thinking how well she remembered that trick of his, the trick of interrupting her, and of how it used to exasperate her six years ago. She used to feel then as though he, quite suddenly, in the middle of what she was saying, put his hand over her lips, turned from her, attended to something different, and then took his hand away, and with just the same slightly too broad smile, gave her his attention again. Now we are ready. That is settled. The colder. He echoed her words, laughing too. Ha-ha! You still say the same things. And there is another thing about you that is not changed at all. Your beautiful voice. Your beautiful way of speaking. Now he was very grave. He leaned towards her, and she smelled the warm, stinging scent of the orange peel. You have only to say one word, and I would know your voice among all other voices. I don't know what it is. I've often wondered. What makes your voice such a haunting memory? Do you remember that first afternoon we spent together at Kew Gardens? You were so surprised because I did not know the names of any flowers. I am still just as ignorant for all you are telling me. But whenever it is very fine and warm, and I see some bright colors... It's awfully strange. I hear your voice saying, Geranium, marigold, and verbena. And I feel those three words are all I recall of some forgotten heavenly language. You remember that afternoon? Oh, yes. Very well. She drew a long, soft breath, as though the paper daffodils between them were almost too sweet to bear. Yet what had remained in her mind of that particular afternoon was an absurd scene over the tea-table, a great many people taking tea in a Chinese pagoda, 
and he behaving like a maniac about the wasps waving them away flapping at them with his straw hat serious and infuriated out of all proportion to the occasion how delighted the sniggering tea-drinkers had been and how she had suffered but now as he spoke that memory faded his was the truer yes it had been a wonderful afternoon full of geranium and marigold and verbena and warm sunshine her thoughts lingered over the last two words as though she sang them in the warmth as it were another memory unfolded she saw herself sitting on a lawn he lay beside her and suddenly after a long silence he rolled over and put his head in her lap i wish he said in a low troubled voice i wish i had taken poison and were about to die here now at that moment a little girl in a white dress holding a long dripping water lily dodged from behind a bush stared at them and dodged back again but he did not see she leaned over him oh why do you say that i could not say that but he gave a kind of soft moan and taking her hand he held it to his cheek because i know i am going to love you too much far too much and i shall suffer so terribly vera because you never never will love me he was certainly far better looking now than he had been then he had lost all that dreamy vagueness and indecision now he had the air of a man who has found his place in life and fills it with a confidence and an assurance which was to say the least impressive he must have made money too his clothes were admirable and at that moment he pulled a russian cigarette case out of his pocket won't you smoke yes i will she hovered over them they look very good i think they are i got them made for me by a little man in st james street i don't smoke very much i'm not like you but when i do they must be delicious very fresh cigarettes smoking isn't a habit with me it's a luxury like perfume are you still so fond of perfumes ah uh, when i was in russia she broke in you've really been to russia oh yes i was there for over a year have you forgotten how we used to talk of going there no i've not forgotten he gave a strange half laugh and leaned back in his chair isn't it curious i have really carried out all those journeys that we planned yes i have been to all those places that we talked of and stayed in them long enough to as you used to say air oneself in them in fact i have spent the last three years of my life travelling all the time spain corsica siberia russia egypt the only country left is china and i mean to go there too when the war is over as he spoke so lightly tapping the end of his cigarette against the ash-tray she felt the strange beast that had slumbered so long within her bosom stir stretch itself yawn pick up its ears and suddenly bound to its feet and fix its longing hungry stare upon those faraway places but all she said was smiling gently how i envy you he accepted that it has been he said very wonderful especially russia russia was all that we had imagined and far far more i even spent some days on a river boat on the volga do you remember that boatman's song that you used to play yes it began to play in her mind as she spoke do you ever play it now no i have no piano he was amazed at that but what has become of your beautiful piano she made a little grimace sold ages ago but you were so fond of music he wondered i have no time for it now said she he let it go at that that river life he went on is something quite special after a day or two you cannot realize that you have ever known another and it is not necessary to know the language the life of the boat creates a bond between you and the people that's more than sufficient you eat with them pass the day with them and in the evening there is that endless singing she shivered 
hearing the boatman's song break out again loud and tragic and seeing the boat floating on the darkening river with melancholy trees on either side yes i should like that said she stroking her muff you'd like almost everything about russian life he said warmly it's so informal so impulsive so free without question and then the peasants are so splendid they are such human beings yes that is it even the man who drives your carriage has has some real part in what is happening i remember the evening a party of us two friends of mine and the wife of one of them went for a picnic by the black sea we took supper and champagne and ate and drank on the grass and while we were eating the coachman came up have a dill pickle he said he wanted to share with us that seemed to me so right so you know what i mean and she seemed at that moment to be sitting on the grass beside the mysteriously black sea black as velvet and rippling against the banks in silent velvet waves she saw the carriage drawn up to one side of the road and the little group on the grass their faces and hands white in the moonlight she saw the pale dress of the woman outspread in her folded parasol lying on the grass like a huge pearl crochet hook apart from them with his supper in a cloth on his knees sat the coachman have a dill pickle said he and although she was not certain what a dill pickle was she saw the greenish glass jar with a red chili like a parrot's beak glimmering through she sucked in her cheek the dill pickle was terribly sour yes i know perfectly what you mean she said in the pause that followed they looked at each other in the past when they had looked at each other like that they had felt such a boundless understanding between them that their souls had as it were put their arms round each other and dropped into the same sea content to be drowned like mournful lovers but now the surprising thing was that it was he who held back he who said what a marvellous listener you are when you look at me with those wild eyes i feel that i could tell you things that i would never breathe to another human being was there just a hint of mockery in his voice or was it her fancy she could not be sure before i met you he said I have never spoken of myself to anybody. How well I remember one night, the night that I brought you the little Christmas tree, telling you all about my childhood, and of how I was so miserable that I had run away and lived under a cart in our yard for two days without being discovered. And you listened, and your eyes shone, and I felt that you had even made the little Christmas tree listen too, as in a fairy story. But of that evening she had remembered a little pot of caviar it had cost seven and sixpence he could not get over it think of it a tiny jar like that costing seven and sixpence while she ate it he watched her delighted and shocked no really that is any money you could not get seven shillings into a little pot that size only think of the profit they must make and he had begun some immensely complicated calculations but now good-bye to the caviar the christmas tree was on the table and the little boy lay under the cart with his head pillowed on the yard dog the dog was called bosun she cried delightedly but he did not follow which dog had you a dog i don't remember a dog at all no no i mean the yard dog when you were a little boy he laughed and snapped the cigarette case too was he do you know i had forgotten that it seems such ages ago i cannot believe that it is only six years after i had recognized you to-day i had to take such a leap i had to take a leap over my whole life to get back to that time i was such a kid then he drummed on the table i have often thought how i must have bored you and now i understand so perfectly why you wrote to me as you did although at the time that letter nearly finished my life i found it the other day and i couldn't help laughing as i read it it was so clever such a true picture of me he glanced up 
You're not going. She had buttoned her collar again and drawn down her veil. Yes, I am afraid I must, she said, and managed to smile. Now she knew that he had been mocking. Ah, no, please, he pleaded. Don't go, just for a moment. And he caught up one of her gloves from the table and clutched at it, as if that would hold her. I see so few people to talk to nowadays that I have turned into a sort of barbarian, he said. Have I said something to hurt you? Not a bit. She lied. But as she watched him draw her glove through his fingers gently, gently her anger really did die down. And besides, at the moment he looked more like himself of six years ago. What I really wanted then, he said softly, was to be a sort of carpet, to make myself into a sort of carpet for you to walk on so that you need not be hurt by the sharp stones and the mud that you hated so. It was nothing more positive than that, nothing more selfish. Only I did desire, eventually, to turn into a magic carpet and carry you away to all those lands you longed to see. As she spoke, she lifted her head as though she drank something. The strange beast in her bosom began to purr. I felt that you were more lonely than anybody else in the world, he went on, and yet, perhaps, that you were the only person in the world who was really, truly alive. Born out of your time, he murmured, stroking the glove. Fated. Ah, oh, God, what had she done? How had she dared to throw away her happiness like this? This was the only man who had ever understood her. Was it too late? Could it be too late? She was that glove that he held in his fingers. And then the fact that you had no friends, and never had made friends with people. How I understood that, for neither had I. Is it just the same now? Yes, she breathed. Just the same. I am as alone as ever. So am I. He laughed gently. Just the same. Suddenly, with a quick gesture, he handed her back the glove and scraped his chair on the floor. But what seemed to me so mysterious then is perfectly plain to me now. And to you too, of course. It was simply that we were such egoists, so self-engrossed, so wrapped up in ourselves that we hadn't a corner in our hearts for anybody else. Do you know? He cried, naive and hearty and dreadfully like another side of that old self again. I began studying a mind system when I was in Russia, and I found that we were not peculiar at all. It's quite a well-known form of... She had gone. He sat there, thunderstruck, astounded beyond words. And then he asked the waitress for his bill. But the cream has not been touched, he said. Please do not charge me for it. End of a dill pickle.